What is forensic meteorology? With the popularity of the CSI television series there has been a meteoric rise in students enrolling in forensic science courses. Forensics draws on a wide variety of sciences in order to solve criminal cases. For instance, there was one episode of CSI in which a character used his knowledge of astronomy to locate a murder scene. Meteorological principles can also be used in forensics, which is frequently applied to criminal or insurance investigations. Meteorologists have been called to testify in court, serve as consultants, or perform research for government agencies, law firms, and private businesses. Using data from satellites, radar, and other sources, a meteorologist could, for example, testify as to the possibility of a building fire being caused by lightning, or whether or not wind conditions could be responsible for an airplane crashing shortly after takeoff. Or whether hazy conditions leading to a car accident were the result of nature or a nearby factory. Qualification as a certified consulting meteorologist is typically required to work as a forensic meteorologist. What standard unit of measurement is used to indicate wind speed? In most forecasts in the United States, wind speed is described in miles per hour. Outside this country, it would be expressed in kilometers per hour. Most other scientists also prefer to use the metric system. However, the Federal Aviation Administration, National Weather Service, and other groups that work with air and ocean travel will use knots, 1 knot equals 1.15 miles per hour, or 1.85 kilometers per hour. Internationally, Wind is also commonly measured in meters per hour. For vertical wind speeds, meteorologists use MIC bars per second, which indicates pressure change with altitude over time, or centimeters per second. What is a coronal mass ejection? A coronal mass ejection is a huge blob of solar material usually highly energetic. Plasma that is thrown outward into space in a huge solar surface explosion. Coronal mass ejections are associated with solar flares. But the two phenomena do not always occur together. When coronal mass ejections reach the space near Earth, artificial satellites can be damaged by the sudden electromagnetic surge caused by the flux of these charged particles. Does it rain in the Arabian Desert? Located on the Arabian Peninsula and covering an area of some 900,000 square miles, 2,300,000 square kilometers. The Arabian Desert is, indeed, a very dry place, 
but rain does fall there. Some parts of this desert receive an average annual rainfall of a mere 1.38 inches, 35 millimeters. On occasion, flash flooding occurs because of rainstorms. The worst of these occurred in 1995. When a storm and high winds caused flash floods that killed five people near Jeddah. What is marine forecasting? The complement to aviation forecasting. Marine forecasting warns seagoing vessels of storms and wave conditions. Such forecasting routinely saves lives, property, and fuel. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Data Buoy Center keeps track of ocean conditions. Particularly issuing hurricane warnings and Warnings about swells that may indicate tsunamis caused by underwater earthquakes. How much sunlight is reflected by snow? Since white reflects snow, it should be no surprise that snow cover bounces sunlight back into the atmosphere and into space at an efficient rate of about 80 percent. Environmentalists speculate that global warming may be accelerated further because as snow melts, more and more of the sun's energy will be absorbed by the ground. How did the Kalpana one get its name? India's Kalpana one satellite was originally called the METSAT, Meteorological Satellite. However, it was renamed in honor of Kalpana Chabla. The Indian astronaut who died in the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster on February 1, 2003. Is meteorology considered a good career? Meteorology is certainly one of the better careers you can go into in terms of income. Stress level, satisfaction, working environment, physical demands, and employment outlook. In its ranking of 250 careers in the United States, the 6th, 2002. Edition of the Jobs Ranked Almanac placed meteorologist as 13th. While this is somewhat lower than the seventh ranking it earned in the previous edition. It is a lot higher than the 38th place it had in the fourth edition, so it seems to be moving up. Can people's moods be affected by sunlight? It is well known that, during the winter, people living in the northern hemisphere tend to experience more depression and listlessness. Sometimes called seasonal affective disorder, sad. This syndrome may be caused by chemical changes in the brain during extended periods of darkness. In addition, 
the human body needs at least a few minutes of sunlight a day to generate vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiency is a chronic problem in many northern states in America. Where it can lead to feelings of depression and a lack of energy and even libido. Who initially proposed the idea of moving continents? The idea of the continents moving around our planet was mentioned as early as 1587 by the Flemish mapmaker. With German origins, Abraham Ortelius, 1527-1598, in his work Thesaurus Geographicus. In 1620, Francis Bacon, 1561-1626, also mentioned the idea. Noting the fit of the coastlines on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. By the 1880s, many other scientists were mentioning the connection. For example, in 1885, Australian geologist Edward Seuss, 1831-1914, proposed that the southern continents had once been a huge land mass that he called Gondwana Land. But it was German scientist Alfred Wegener, 1880-1930, who first formally published the idea of continental displacement. Or drift in his 1915 book, The Origins of Continents and Oceans. He believed the continents were once joined together into one supercontinent, a place he named Pangaea. Also spelled Pangaea, meaning all land, that was surrounded by a superocean called Panthalassa. He also suggested that the massive continent divided about 200 million years ago. With Laurasia moving to the north and Gondwana, or Gondwana land, to the south. Wegener based his ideas of continental motion on numerous observations. The continental distribution of fossil ferns called Glossopteres, from studies by Seuss, the discovery of coal in Antarctica by Sir Ernest Henry Shackleton. 1874 to 1922, similar glacial erosion seen in the tropical areas of India, South Africa, and Australia, the apparent fit of the South America and West African continental shorelines. And, although it may only be legend, by watching ice flows drifting on the sea. Although Wegener is now considered the man who started a revolution in geology. His ideas were hotly debated by scientists of his time. Not only was he a meteorologist in a community of geologists. But he could offer no logical mechanism for the movement of the land masses. It wasn't until the 1960s long after his tragic death in Greenland. He died at the age of 50 while on a rescue mission, that Wegener was vindicated. By then, scientific measurements, observations, and technology had advanced enough to prove that. Indeed, the continents are moving around the planet on giant lithospheric plates. Wegener's theory of continental displacement was replaced by the new field of plate tectonics, which is the basis for modern geology. How is pollution related to weather? Pollution both natural and man-made has numerous, often complex effects on the weather. 
air pollutants, for instance, can cause acid rain. And pollution that destroys the ozone layer can lead to health risks to people and even wipe out species. Many scientists believe that human-generated pollution is causing climate change, which affects weather patterns on a global scale. While some pollutants, such as gases from volcanic eruptions, can have harmful consequences. Many meteorologists, environmentalists, and climatologists fear that human activity is having a much bigger negative impact on the weather and our health than anything currently occurring from natural sources. What is a cloud chamber? Cloud chambers were originally designed to study radioactivity. Scottish physicist Charles Thomson Rees Wilson, 1869-1959, invented the chamber in 1912. Winning the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1927 for his invention. The procedure involved saturating an enclosed chamber in water vapor until it was supersaturated. Ionized particles would then be passed through the chamber, serving as nuclei around which droplets would form. This had the advantage of making the particles visible to physicists. And the behavior of the particles could be studied. What do meteorologists mean when they talk about POP? POP is an abbreviation for probability of precipitation. How much carbon dioxide is being produced by cars and industrial emissions in the United States? A 2004 study from the Environmental Protection Agency noted that total emissions from 1990 to 2004 have increased by 15.8%. While this is not great, when compared to an increase in the U.S. gross domestic product of 51% over the same period, it is a somewhat controlled increase. At what point does the sky turn from blue to black? The blueness of the sky fades away as you get higher in the atmosphere. By the time you are in the lower troposphere, such as when flying in the upper elevations in a commercial jet plane around 35,000 feet. About 10,600 meters, the air is quite thin and begins to look dark. Above 150,000 feet, about 45,750 meters, the sky turns increasingly black as you enter the stratosphere. Why do sunspots appear dark? Sunspots are a slightly cooler temperature, about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit 1100 degrees Celsius cooler than their surrounding photospheric gas, and so in the bright backlighting, 
sunspots appear dark. Do not be fooled, though, a sunspot is still many thousands of degrees. And the amount of electromagnetic energy that courses through sunspots is tremendous. What two volcanic eruptions had the biggest impacts on the climate in the 20th century? The eruption of El Shishan in southern Mexico, which lasted from March 29 through April 4, 1982, and the June 15, 1991, eruption of MT. Pinatubo in the Philippines caused significant disruptions to the planet's climate. El Shishan shot about 7.75 million tons, over 7 billion kilograms, of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. As well as some 24.25 million tons, 22 billion kilograms, of other dust and particles. Coincidentally, there was a strong El Nino building at the same time. While the El Nino effect worked to warm ocean waters, the El Shishan eruption was cooling the atmosphere. And the result was that the two effectively cancelled each other out. That summer, when temperatures should have increased because of El Nino, the average temperatures were actually fairly normal. During the winter of 1982 to 1983, though, temperatures in Europe, Siberia, and North America were higher than normal. And temperatures in the Middle East, China, Greenland, and Alaska were cooler. This was because the gases from El Shishan had caused an Arctic oscillation in the stratosphere. Changing Air Current Patterns when Mount Pinatubo erupted, it sent 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the sky. And estimates are that this resulted in an average worldwide temperature drop of 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit 0.8 degrees Celsius in 1992. The effects continued through 1993. As the haze produced by the extra sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere reflected the sun's rays. What is an aneroid barometer? The word aneroid means without fluid, and so aneroid barometers do not need mercury in order to work. French inventor Lucien Vitti, 1805-1866, built upon a concept first proposed by German mathematician Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716, in which a metallic capsule surrounded by a vacuum could be used to measure air pressure. Using very thin pieces of metal, Vitti managed to connect such a capsule to highly sensitive dials displayed behind glass within an encasement. This was highly detailed work on the level of the finest clock craftsmanship. Aneroid barometers were very difficult to make in Vitti's time. But high-tech instruments are produced today using such devices as electron beams welding copper beryllium alloys. Because aneroid barometers are made of metal. They are also sensitive to changes in temperature and altitude. Bimetallic strips can be used to compensate for temperature, but altitude poses more of a problem. For this reason, aneroid barometers work best at elevations below 3,000 feet. 
about 915 meters, but they can be calibrated for higher altitudes if needed. Who is considered one of the most important pioneers in the study of climate change? English meteorologist and climatologist Hubert Horace Lamb, 1913-1997 who founded the Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia in 1971. Is considered by many to be the greatest climatologist of the 20th century. He began his career as a weather forecaster for the Irish Meteorological Office and later was with the British Meteorological Office. While there, he participated in a Norwegian whaling expedition in Antarctica from 1946 to 1947. It was during this time in Antarctica that he began to study how the world's climate must have changed. And he pursued the subject after joining the Climatology Division of Britain's Meteorological Office in 1954. Using records there, he researched and published papers and books about how Great Britain's climate had changed noticeably since the middle of the 19th century. Why is Greenland called green when it is mostly covered in ice? When Scandinavian explorers first discovered the large island north of Iceland in the late 10th century, they wished to attract more settlers to the land, and so they named it Greenland, according to some sources. Another explanation is that the island was actually named Gruntland. The word Grunt meaning shallow bay. The name was later mistranslated on maps, becoming Greenland. While much of the island is inhospitably covered by a huge glacier, the southern coastline does actually have vegetation and has served as good fishing ground. The Little Ice Age of the 15th century decimated the Viking settlements, however. Who invented the barometer? Invented in 1644 by Evangelista Torricelli, 1608-1647, a barometer is a device for measuring air pressure. Torricelli was a student, for a brief three months, of Galileo Galilei, 1564 to 1642 and he was inspired by his mentor's observation that piston pumps can only lift water up 33 feet about 10 meters after which point it is impossible to pump the water any higher after Galileo died Torricelli continued to build on this observation he theorized correctly, that air had weight and, therefore, exerted pressure. He tested his theory by filling a dish with mercury, he used mercury because it was denser than water and therefore would require a much smaller amount to indicate pressure changes. He then took a four-foot-long glass tube that was open on one end, filled it with mercury and turned it upside down with the open end beneath the surface of the mercury. Some, but not all, 
of the mercury exited the tube, 30 inches, 760 millimeters, remained. This meant that the remaining mercury in the tube stayed in the tube because air in the atmosphere was exerting pressure on the surface of the mercury in the dish. Not only did this experiment prove Torricelli's theory that air had pressure, but he was also the first to create a vacuum, now called a Torricellian vacuum. The word barometer, which means weight measure, was not coined until 1665 by Irish scientist and theologian Robert Boyle, 1627-1691. Boyle came up with a new design for the barometer in which a U-shaped tube was used. Eliminating the need for a mercury reservoir. English physicist Robert Hooke, 1635-1703. Made another improvement on the barometer by creating an easy-to-read dial display. What is forensic meteorology? With the popularity of the CSI television series there has been a meteoric rise in students enrolling in forensic science courses. Forensics draws on a wide variety of sciences in order to solve criminal cases. For instance, there was one episode of CSI in which a character used his knowledge of astronomy to locate a murder scene. Meteorological principles can also be used in forensics, which is frequently applied to criminal or insurance investigations. Meteorologists have been called to testify in court, serve as consultants, or perform research for government agencies, law firms, and private businesses. Using data from satellites, radar, and other sources, a meteorologist could, for example, testify as to the possibility of a building fire being caused by lightning, or whether or not wind conditions could be responsible for an airplane crashing shortly after takeoff or whether hazy conditions leading to a car accident were the result of nature or a nearby factory. Qualification as a certified consulting meteorologist is typically required to work as a forensic meteorologist. Which ocean currents are the slowest? The slowest currents are found deep in the world's oceans. These sluggish, cold waters take up to about 1,000 years to circulate around the entire globe. What was the perfect storm? The subject of a 1997 novel by Sebastian Junger, as well as a 2000 movie starring George Clooney, Diane Lane, and Mark Wahlberg, The Perfect Storm was also a real, terrifying event. During the last days of October 1991, an extratropical cyclone organized itself several hundred miles off the coast of Nova Scotia. At the same time, 
Hurricane Grace a relatively weak Category 2 hurricane moved toward the storm from the south. As Grace approached the northern cyclone, the winds from the cyclone did something unusual. Typically, tropical hurricanes will tend to move away from the shoreline as they move north. But the cyclone winds, spinning in a northeastern swirl, blew Grace toward the northeast coast. The two storms merged and became known as the 1991 Halloween Nor'easter. The result was one of the most destructive storms in history, with winds up to 65 knots. 75 miles per hour or 120 kilometers per hour, and ocean waves up to 39 feet, 12 meters, high. A dozen people died in the storm, including the six crew members aboard the sword fishing vessel Andrea Gale. The subject of Junger's novel, and one billion dollars in damages were incurred. In another unusual twist, the Halloween nor'easter had turned into a hurricane by November 1st. An event that is quite uncommon for an extratropical low-pressure system, though not unheard of. The new hurricane, however, remained unnamed because the National Weather Service thought it might be confusing to the American media to rename the Halloween Nor'easter. What are the chances that I will be struck by lightning? The chance of being struck by lightning at least once in your lifetime is about 1 in 600,000. Are hailstones always round? Usually, Hailstones are round or lumpy round little ice balls. Sometimes, however, they can be oblong or have protruding spikes. How do meteorologists classify thunderstorms? There are several classifications of thunderstorms, single cell the smallest type of storm system. Single cell storms form from a convective loop of warm updrafts and cool down drafts. They usually form the weakest and briefest rainstorms. Multicell a storm system formed from two or more storm cells. Supercell the largest and most dangerous type of storm system. And one which is often associated with tornadoes. Supercells develop in massive cumulonimbus storm clouds and are characterized by nearly vertical. Unsuppressed updrafts and precipitation falling at a nearly horizontal angle. Because the air currents are not suppressed, they tend to continue building in strength for hours. Squall line A line of cumulonimbus storm clouds reaching up to 600 miles, 965 kilometers, long. What is the effect of a microburst on aircraft? Microbursts are downbursts of air with a diameter of 2.5 miles, 4 kilometers, or less. Often associated with thunderstorms. 
they can generate winds of hurricane force that change direction abruptly. Headwinds can become tailwinds in a matter of seconds, forcing aircraft to lose air speed and altitude. After microbursts caused several major air catastrophes in the 1970s and 1980s. The Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, installed warning and radar systems at airports to alert pilots when conditions were right for wind shears and microbursts. How can a gardener preserve unripe tomatoes before a winter frost? As any gardener knows, the first freeze of the winter season will kill many. Plants and ruin fruits and vegetables that have not yet been harvested. Tomatoes that are still a bit green can be placed in a paper bag and stored in a dry, dark pantry, where they should continue to ripen normally. Does drinking alcohol truly warm up a person's body? While drinking a shot of bourbon or other alcoholic drink on a winter's day might provide a sensation of being warmed up. In actuality alcohol makes a person's body more vulnerable to the cold. When you drink booze, what happens is that the alcohol causes blood vessels to constrict. This forces more blood to the surface of the skin. Which stimulates nerves in the body and makes the drinker feel warmer. The actual effect, however, is that increased blood to the surface of the body causes one to lose more heat. Lowering body temperature and making him or her more susceptible to frostbite. Add to this the fact that alcohol impairs one's judgment. And the idea of drinking on the ski slopes proves to be a very bad one indeed. What is a blizzard? According to the U.S. National Weather Service, a winter storm is considered a blizzard when wind speeds reach 35 miles 56 kilometers per hour and there is poor visibility of less than one quarter of a mile, 400 meters. Snow does not need to be falling at the time. But blowing and drifting should occur with drifts exceeding 10 inches, 25 centimeters, deep. How many people die in the United States because of avalanches? Deaths from avalanches are fairly uncommon, but they do occur. Often as a result of carelessness or from not heeding posted signs. Below is a list of fatalities covering the last decade. What is a temperature inversion? Simply put, this is when temperatures in the troposphere, lowest layer of the atmosphere, are colder at lower altitudes than at higher altitudes, 
which is just the opposite of what normally occurs. Inversions can occur as the result of weather fronts moving through an area. Or because of winds blowing over ground that is frozen over with ice or snow, or because of frigid lake or ocean conditions. When an inversion occurs it prevents air from circulating vertically. Which can result in pollutants being trapped at low altitudes. Inversions also disrupt radio and radar transmissions. Who should be credited with inventing weather radar? No one person decided to use radar for weather forecasts. With the technology already in place, it was simply adapted to this purpose when Experiments in Britain and the United States showed that radio waves bounced off clouds. Radar was first used to specifically obtain weather data in 1949. But it was not until the mid-1950s that a weather station using radar technology was established in the United States. This happened after the eastern seaboard was hit by two vicious hurricanes in 1954 and 1955 the U.S. Weather Bureau was then authorized by Congress to create a national weather radar grid. And so the weather surveillance radar, WSR-57, was founded in 1957. WSR systems used vacuum tubes and other technologies that were becoming outdated by the late 1970s. Despite the fact that vacuum tubes were in short supply, and other parts had to be hand machined in. Order to keep the weather system running, Congress did not approve replacing the system until the 1990s. What did the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, recently say about power plant emissions? In 2004, the EPA estimated that every year about 2,800 people die from lung cancer and another 38. 200 have heart attacks as a direct result of pollutants from power plants. What is a meteor shower? Meteors are often called shooting stars because they are bright for a moment and move quickly across the sky. Usually, a shooting star appears in the sky about once an hour or so. Sometimes, though, a large number of meteors appear in the sky over the course of several nights. These meteors will appear to come from the same part of the sky. And dozens or hundreds, Sometimes even thousands, of meteors can be seen every hour. We call such dazzling displays meteor showers. The strongest meteor showers are sometimes called meteor storms. What is a geomagnetic storm? A geomagnetic storm is the term used for a strong increase in solar wind. Activity including intense X-rays that affects the Earth's magnetic field.
What are the two major characteristics of volcanic eruptions? A volcano can experience violent eruptions or less explosive. More effusive eruptions that produce wide-ranging lava flows. In general, the eruptive characteristics of a volcano are based on the silica and water content of the magma. Does air pollution reach as far as the North Pole? Yes. Winds can carry air pollutants far beyond the Arctic Circle, resulting in a condition called Arctic haze. The pollution tends to be worse during winter and spring. When prevailing winds from northern Europe to Siberia blow emissions northward from industrial areas. Recent shifts from coal burning to natural gas. Primarily from Russia, has created cleaner air conditions, fortunately. What is a wedge tornado? A wedge tornado is one that appears as a thick, squat column. The observable height of the funnel is about the same as the width. Is Moscow, Russia, colder than Minneapolis, Minnesota? Moscow is at a latitude of 55 degrees 45 minutes, while Minneapolis is at 44 degrees 53 minutes. Nevertheless, they have similar climates. Both cities experience mean January temperatures of about 14 degrees Fahrenheit minus 10 degrees Celsius. While Julys are about 66 degrees Fahrenheit 18.9 degrees Celsius in Moscow and 74 degrees Fahrenheit 23.3 degrees Celsius in Minneapolis on average. What is the difference between climate and weather? Climate is the long-term average weather for a particular place. The weather is the current condition of the atmosphere. So, the weather in Barrow, Alaska, might be a warm 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 21 degrees Celsius, but its tundra climate is generally polar-like and cold. How much rain does it take to make a flood? The amount varies widely for different areas. In some U.S. western deserts, or in some large urban areas. Just a few minutes of strong rain will cause a flash flood in canyons and low-lying areas. In areas prone to greater rainfall amounts, it often takes quite a bit more rain. Sometimes a few days or weeks worth, to cause rivers to overflow and dams to fill up. Raising concerns of those who live downstream. Areas that normally receive more rainfall have better natural drainage.
systems and are usually home to plants that readily absorb the extra water. Why do environmental firms hire meteorologists? Weather patterns have an important effect on the distribution of pollutants in the air, on land, and in our oceans. Environmental firms, as well as government agencies such as the Environmental Protection Agency, hire meteorologists to help them predict the Environmental impact of construction projects such as power plants and factories. An understanding of prevailing winds near a proposed coal burning plant, for instance, will help people understand how potential air pollution, acid rain, and ozone levels will impact the environment not only locally but also, perhaps, across many states or even countries. Did volcanoes play a role in creating Earth's atmosphere? Scientists now believe that much of our planet's atmosphere was generated by carbon dioxide. Water vapor, nitrogen, argon, and methane spewing out of volcanoes. When life began to form as primitive plant cells. The carbon dioxide issued from volcanoes was absorbed by these plants and then released as oxygen. At first, the oxygen reacted with iron and other metals in the Earth's crust, creating iron oxides that form the commonly seen reddish earth in the ground. Eventually, though, there was enough oxygen that it became part of the atmosphere, and breathable air was created. Who first correctly wrote about the structure of snowflakes? This honor goes to Han Ying, a Han Dynasty scholar who published moral discourses illustrating the Han text of the Book of Songs in 135 B. C.E. Han correctly described how snowflakes always take on a hexagonal form of some kind. Unless the flakes are broken, even though this six-sided fundamental structure has incredible variety, the Western scientific world would not get this right until the 17th century. When German mathematician and astronomer Johannes Kepler, 1571-1630, published a New Year's gift, or on the six-cornered snowflake in 1611. English mathematician and astronomer Thomas Harriot, c. 1560-1621, actually correctly described snowflake's hexagonal form in 1591. But this description was not made public. What is a multiple vortex tornado? Sometimes a central tornado can be surrounded by smaller tornadoes called subvortices or suction vortices. There can be as many as seven subvortices surrounding the central tornado. 
though 2 to 5 is more common. Interestingly, these smaller tornadoes tend to be more intense, with winds spinning at about 100 miles. 160 kilometers per hour or more faster than the central vortex. What is the difference between freezing rain, sleet, and hail? Freezing rain is rain that falls as a liquid but turns to ice on. Contact with a freezing object to form a smooth ice coating called glaze. Usually freezing rain only lasts a short time, because it either turns to rain or to snow. Sleet is frozen or partially frozen rain in the form of ice pellets. Sleet forms when rain falls from a warm layer of air. Passes through a freezing air layer near the Earth's surface, and forms hard, clear. Tiny ice pellets that can hit the ground so fast that they bounce off with a sharp click. Hail is a larger form of sleet. How is the time set for the beginning of sunrise and sunset? In the United States, sunrise officially begins when the leading edge of the sun disk first begins to rise over the horizon. And sunset happens when the top of the sun disappears behind the horizon. In Great Britain, however, sunrise and sunset are measured by the time when the middle of the sun is at the edge of the horizon. Scientists use highly sensitive light measuring instruments to calculate when dawn is approaching as much as 90 minutes before sunrise actually occurs. What is a rainbow? Rainbows are colorful bands of light that are formed when water particles in the air reflect sunlight. As sunlight enters the drops and droplets, the different wavelengths of colors that compose sunlight are refracted at different wavelengths to produce a spectrum of color. To see a rainbow, you must be standing with the sun behind you and the raindrops in front of you. The sun needs to be less than 42 degrees above the horizon to obtain the correct angle so that the light waves are properly reflected. The light is refracted as it enters a raindrop. Reflects off the inside of the back of the raindrop, and is refracted again as it leaves. How do I know if meteorology is for me? Choosing a career to pursue is one of the toughest choices anyone has to make. Unlike generations past, though, most Americans do not remain in their first career choice forever and many change careers three or more times over their working lives. This is one reason why meteorology is actually a good choice. Because it can be applied to a wide variety of specialties. There are some questions you can ask yourself before you decide to pursue meteorology. 1.
What was the first satellite used for monitoring the weather? The first man-made satellite used to monitor weather conditions was the television and infrared observation satellite. Tyros I, which was launched by NASA on April 1, 1960. While the photographs taken were not of the high-resolution standards we see today, they were the first to reveal just how clouds and storms can be remarkably well organized, a fact that surprised meteorologists at the time. Tyro's eye's other groundbreaking accomplishment was to spot a previously undetected tropical storm near Australia nine days after its launch. Australians along that country's east coast were thus the first people. Thanks to modern technology, to get a heads up that a strong storm was approaching. Why don't we see hurricanes in the South Atlantic Ocean? The cold sea surface temperatures of the South Atlantic and atmospheric conditions such as the tendency of the intertropical convergence zone to remain in the northern hemisphere make hurricane formation south of the equator unlikely. However, in March 2004, a hurricane did strike the coast of Brazil, which was a very unusual event. Is there such a thing as a megacremeteor? Yes. Megacremeteors are not hailstones because they don't form in clouds the way hailstones do. They are giant ice stones that do not require thunderstorms in order to form. Megacremeteors range in size from about a third of a pound, half a kilogram, to a monstrous one found in Brazil that weighed 137 pounds, 62 kilograms. What is a rain shadow? When the moisture in the air is squeezed out by orographic precipitation. There's not much left for the other side of the mountains. The dry side of the mountains experiences a rain shadow effect. What is sulfur dioxide? Burning coal is a primary source of sulfur dioxide, so too, in the atmosphere. And so it was one of the first causes of air pollution, arising during the industrial age. Sulfur in bituminous and other forms of coal, when burned, bonds with oxygen to form this pollutant. Which irritates eyes and the respiratory system. It is also a source of acid rain. Technologies have been developed that scrub sulfur dioxide emissions from smokestacks and have done much to improve air quality. While the United States has dramatically lowered these emissions, other developing nations, such as China and India, do not impose vigorous restrictions on sulfur dioxide from factories and power plants.
How do ocean currents affect weather? The world's oceans cover about 70% of our planet's surface. Thus, ocean water also absorbs more heat from the sun than the land does. In addition to this, water absorbs and emits heat energy more slowly than land does. Warm water, therefore, remains warm longer, and cold water remains cold longer. As the world's ocean waters circulate through the action of currents. This warm or cold water can be transported long distances before it changes temperature. This is an important way that Earth distributes its heat energy. Warm waters in the tropical Atlantic Ocean are carried north as far as England and Scandinavia. For instance, while warm waters in the Indian Ocean circulate down toward Australia and South Africa. Land barriers, such as that formed by Central America, are vital for diverting currents in various directions. It's because of this that currents from Western Africa move toward the Caribbean and are then deflected north. Without Central America, Great Britain would be as frigidly cold as the remote wastes of northern Siberia. What is St. Elmo's Fire? St. Elmo's fire has been described as a corona from electric discharge produced on high. Grounded metal objects, chimney tops, ship masts, and aircraft wing tips. Since it often occurs during thunderstorms, the electrical source may be lightning. Another description refers to this phenomenon as weak static electricity. Formed when an electrified cloud touches a high, exposed point. Molecules of gas in the air around this point become ionized and glow. The name originated with sailors who were among the first to witness the display of spear like or tufted flames on the tops of their ship's masts. Saint Elmo, a corruption of Saint Ermo, is the patron saint of sailors, so they named the fire after him. How did abrupt climate changes in the past come to be called Don's Giardeshger events? Danish geophysicist Willy Donsgaard, 1922, discovered that by measuring the levels of oxygen isotopes and deuterium, a hydrogen isotope, in glaciers, as well as dust content and the acidity of ice, it was possible to reconstruct what the Earth's climate was in the past. He came about his Conclusion by studying ice cores drilled out of glaciers in Greenland in the 1960s with Swiss physicist Hans Eschger. 1927-1998, the inventor of the Eschger counter, a radiation measuring device. Eschger and Dons Giard drilled ice core samples dating back some 150,000 years in Earth's history. Layers in the ice showed that there had, in that time, been 24 abrupt changes in the world's climate. These are now called Dunst G. Ardeshger events.
How bad was the blizzard of 1888? After a severe blizzard hit the high plains of the United States in February 1888, causing the deaths of many people and farm animals. An even more destructive blizzard wreaked havoc on the east coast from Maine to Chesapeake Bay from March 11 to 14. Several feet of snow fell all over the region, and in Saratoga Springs. New York 52 inches, 1.32 meters, of snow fell and there were drifts of up to 52 feet, 16 meters, deep. Wind speeds ranged up to 70 miles, 113 kilometers, per hour. By the time the storm was over, more than 400 people had lost their lives. What is a barometer? A barometer is a device that measures air pressure. A standard barometer consists of a glass tube filled with mercury, a liquid metal. That is inserted into a reservoir, which also contains mercury. When the surrounding air pressure exerts more weight on the reservoir than the mercury in the tube does. The mercury level rises, and vice versa. What is diffraction? Diffraction is the phenomenon of how light bends around small objects or through small openings. These objects and openings have to be small enough to interfere with wavelengths of light. And so wavelengths in the red spectrum, longer wavelengths, are more affected by light in the bluer spectrum. Diffraction can cause a blurring of light as well as causing interference in the transmission of invisible energies, such as radio waves and X-rays. What is a dry front? A dry front also called a dry line or dew point front is a border line. Separating a mass of dry air from one of much more humid air. Often found east of the Rocky Mountains, these fronts will find the warmer. Drier air lifting the cooler, more humid air ahead of it in the higher altitudes while humid air near the ground is denser than the dry air and the drier air will flow over it. The result is an air mass reversal that can precipitate the formation of cumulonimbus clouds, thunderstorms, and, quite often, tornadoes. Who were the first people to successfully forecast a tornado? You. S. Army officers Ernest Fabush and Robert Miller were the first to correctly predict a tornado. Would form on March 25, 1948. Recognizing that weather patterns in central Oklahoma were very similar to those that had occurred a few days earlier when a tornado hit Tinker Air Force Base. 
Fabush and Miller told their superiors and a decision was made to warn residents about the possible threat. A tornado again hit the Tinker base a few hours later. What is the best weather for maple syrup to be produced? Maple syrup harvesters wait until nighttime temperatures dip below freezing. While day temperatures are above freezing. The conditions are ripe for the sap in maple trees to flow best. Who came up with the idea for volunteer weather observers? That credit goes to American physicist and mathematician Joseph Henry, 1797-1878. The second president of the National Academy of Sciences who was also the first secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Henry made advances in the area of electromagnetics, which led to his study in electromagnetic relays. Which finally, was the basis for Samuel Morse's, 1791 to 1872, invention of the telegraph. While secretary at the Smithsonian, it dawned on Henry that the wonderful new telegraph could be used to link together weather observers throughout the country who could then relay the information to Washington, D.C. This became the network of volunteer observers that we have today. Who was Cleveland Abbey? Also famous as the person who proposed the creation of time zones, Cleveland Abbey. 1838-1916, was an American meteorologist and founder of the Weather Bulletin. EST 1869, the first daily periodical to include weather forecasts. He also established the National Weather Bureau in 1870, which is now the National Weather Service. How does air flow around low and high pressure systems? Air tends to flow toward a low pressure system and away from a high pressure system. In the northern hemisphere, the air will spiral in a counterclockwise direction as it moves toward a low pressure center and it will move in a clockwise direction as it shifts away from a high pressure center. <laughs>